Okay, well, welcome um, back to Baking with Ancient Grains. This is our fifth and final week of the series, and we hope everyone has learned a great deal. I know that um, as Aaron and Caitlin and I have worked on this project together the last month or so, we've all learned from each other. So I hope that you've learned some things too. So with that, once again, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Youngquist from up in Warland. She's the Ag Educator for Washakie County and up there in the Bighorn Basin. And um, she's gonna give us a little more on the field trials they're doing with the ancient grains and some more information to share with us. So take it away, Caitlin. Well, thank you, Denise. This has been a really fun series and it's, it's got me inspired to try a few new things um, and to continue my adventures with baking and cooking with ancient grains. What I'm gonna share with folks um, today is a little bit about the research that's going on around the state as part of this uh, Wyoming First Grains project. This is a picture of the research field in Sheridan where we are um, doing some trials at looking at the water use and the nutrient use of some of these grains compared to a modern wheat. And what we're finding is that they can thrive in a lower input system, meaning they um, need less nitrogen and less, uh, particularly less nitrogen than some of their modern counterparts. So we're still, um, we still have a lot to learn there. And we know that um, there are very many different conditions, challenging growing conditions around Wyoming. And we're still, we are growing them on five farms and three research stations around the state. And one thing that we have found is that einkorn is probably the most challenging to grow. It's the earliest ancestor of wheat. And par par particularly because it is very slow to get started. And that means it's less competitive with weeds. And so if you have a lot of weeds in that field and that einkorn is very slow to get started, it's not very competitive. Competitive. But once it gets going, it's a beautiful, tall, tall green. And one farmer that's growing it for us found that his cows far preferred the straw from the einkorn to the barley straw, which I thought was interesting. And the emmer is a little bit more competitive than the, the einkorn with the wheat. We actually have two different kinds of emmer we're growing. One is a blue emmer, and then one is a variety from Montana called Lucille. And they are doing really well. We've had some beautiful fields of those around the state. And then the spelt is even more competitive because it's been, it's had more, um, um, effort put into developing that those varieties around the country. And so it's pretty competitive and actually is very comparable to wheat with how it's grown. And there also are some forage varieties of spelt. So that's some of the things that we found. Um, they do well, like I said, in low input systems, and that could be a great fit in Wyoming. And we look forward to exploring that a little bit more. We're also doing some research with malting comparing how emmer and spelt malt compared to barley. And we found it's actually a little bit more challenging in the hole. Barley is typically malted in the hole when it's used for making beer. When we malted the emmer in the hole, it was problematic because the hole is so big. So it needed to be deholed, run through our deholer equipment and then remalted. So we're still learning a lot about that as we go and the possibility of spelt or emmer as um, kind of add-ons for craft brewing or unique flavors in beer and the potential market for that for a Wyoming product. So we're pretty hopeful about that. I mentioned the nutrient and water use and we're also looking at the nutrition. So um, there's a lot of confusing information on the internet about the sort of the miracle nutrition of these ancient grains. So we're working with our um, UW faculty to, to uh, sample, to, to analyze some of the different samples we've grown around the state and look at some of those products and see what the nutritional profiles really are, uh, minerals, protein, a few things like that. And then also developing those markets. So is, is there a market in Wyoming to work with, with bakeries or restaurants to, to use some of these products and develop Wyoming markets? So that's what we're doing with this project. We're really excited um, to be a part of it and to be working with the nutrition team to develop some recipes for an upcoming bullet and you may want to know where you can get these grains. Unfortunately, we do not have a retail outlet yet through the university. Uh, we will hopefully soon at, at this website, the Neolithic brand website. If you're coming through Warland, please stop by the extension office and I will gladly get you some samples. Um, same thing if you're in Powell, you can go to the um, university research station there in Powell and pick up some samples. There's a company, a new company called Wyoming Heritage Grains. They're located in Powell. They sell to farmer's market and they're very active on Facebook. And I highly recommend you check them out as well. They have a variety of heritage wheats and I believe they have some emmer as well. 
And Wheat Montana and Timeless Natural Foods, those are both Montana companies that sell some of these products, uh, some of these different grains and um, direct from the farm. And so I highly recommend that you check them out as well. So best of luck with your experimenting and cooking with ancient grains. And I look forward to having some Wyoming product that we'll be able to share with you. It's all you, Denise. Okay. Well, thanks again, Caitlin, for sharing. And once again, if anybody has questions for um, Caitlin or myself um, or Carrie down at CEREC, just give us a call. Um, we will be posting on the website some more resources um, on the Facebook page, I should say. Um, some different things that we have found and um, want to share and also uh, kind of an overview of the Wyoming First Grains or Ancient Grains product project. So we're gonna be sending that and it'll have Caitlin's email address on it and Carrie's and kind of gives you an overview of what we've done, they've done so far with the project. And we're gonna be posting that. We're also gonna post a create a recipe using spelt from Utah State University and a bulletin from the Wheat Foods Council on Ancient Grains and then some different recipes that um, the Neolithic brand and ancient grains here in Wyoming, some spelt salad, um, spelt grain bowls, some different recipes that we have shown, as Caitlin said last week, we've just done the baking part, but there's a ton of other things you can do with these grains. So um, hopefully by some of our extra things that we'll be posting, you can get some other ideas of what, what to do. So with that, we're gonna start our last recipe of the series. And these are called English scones. And they're, they're basically a biscuit type pro product, but just kind of a little fancier maybe. Um, we've done these a couple times with our 4-H kids and um, they really like them and they're really simple and quick and easy to put together. So the first thing um, we're going to do is in our large bowl is mix our flour and it, this recipe is not a whole wheat recipe, but we make it into one. We're going to use a cup and a quarter of the spelt flour and a cup and a quarter of all purpose flour. The recipe you, um, does call for just two and a half cups of all purpose flour, but we like them made with the, with the spelt or the whole wheat flour. So we're gonna combine our flour. And this is a recipe that um, freezes well, so you could make them ahead of time and um, then just bring them out when you're ready to serve them. The way we've like to eat them is with um, strawberry jam and usually the freezer strawberry jam and some whipped cream but they also say just um, any fruit jam or um, with clotted cream. I have had clotted cream once in my whole life and I like whipped cream a lot better so that's what we serve them with this whipped cream. This would make a great dessert or um, kind of if you're having a tea or something, these would be a great addition to that. And again, we want to spoon our flour into our measuring cups lightly and not pack it in there else um, whatever product you're making will be way too dry. So with that, we're going to um, Put in our salt, which is a quarter teaspoon of salt, which is not very much. And three and a half teaspoons of baking powder. The baking powder is the leavening. 
And so with this amount of leavening, they're going to rise really, really well. As with any recipe you're making, you want to make sure your um, ingredients are fresh. And so we had an older container of baking powder in our cupboard here, but I went and bought fresh baking powder for these to make sure they really would really rise nicely today. So there's three and a half. And the trick with this much baking powder as well, is you want to really get that mixed in so that you don't, um, as you're eating, don't um, kind of bite into a pocket of baking powder because it can be very, very bitter. So with that, we're gonna use um, our spoon and just whisk this together, stir it together really well. And then we're going to add um, real butter and three quarters of a cube. And you want it to be really, really cold. So three quarters of a cube is six tablespoons. The colder it is, the better. And for this, you would use either a pastry blender, which is this little tool if you don't know what a pastry blender is, I'll show you here. Um, because you want it to work into our flour and look like little peas, the size of little peas. You can if you don't have this little tool that's sharp bladed there on the bottom. You can use two forks. I'm not that handy with two forks and it takes me forever. So. This is a really handy tool to have for baking pie crust, um, biscuits, these scones. You just keep kind of scraping the butter away from the blade. And it doesn't take long until all the butter is covered in um, the flour. And I just bought a new pastry um, cutter. And you're looking at probably a seven or eight dollar investment is all. So it's not a crazy high expensive tool that you're not ever going to use. But if you're going to do a lot of baking and biscuits, it's a really good investment. And the trick with anything like biscuits or scones. Um, you want to, once we add the liquid, you want to combine those very quickly. And you don't beat them till they're really smooth. They're, you just, till the dry ingredients are wet or moist. So it's getting just about there because we're about the size of peas. And this is distributed your butter throughout the flour mixture. And it is really important to use cold butter. Because warm butter just creates this big glob. And I know that's not a very technical term, but that's what it looks like. It's just one giant glob. Okay, so, and it's a good thing you should always reread read your recipe because now I'm going to have to, I forgot the sugar. And we need three tablespoons of sugar. So we can take our pastry blender and blend this back in. It's always good to reread your recipe. And we have found doing these little Facebook lives, no matter if you know the recipe or not, it's hard to talk do the recipe and measure correctly all at the same time. So we're going to have to invest in a teleprompter that stands over here behind the camera. That would be wonderful because <laughs> it always doesn't fail that you're going along and you think you have everything. So prior to us starting, I did heat our milk. Um, again, you just want it warm, um, not hot, but again, you want 
this warm milk to get in there and it'll mix up quicker. So in our, um, in our milk, we're going to put a teaspoon of vanilla and a teaspoon of lemon juice. So the lemon juice almost kind of curdles the milk. And we're gonna let it sit for just a minute. And you probably on the screen saw Erin take our baking sheet and put it in the oven. We have preheated the oven to 400 degrees. And this is a recipe that you want the baking sheet hot. So with that, we're going to just stir this up gently. Make sure it's good and mixed. And then we're going to combine these quickly using a fork. Again, a fork, it's a lot harder to over mix your batter. This is another recipe that, um, like Denise said, we've done with um, our 4-H kids and it's been very successful. So it is a great recipe to do baking with kids because there's, you know, minimal ingredients to get measured and mixed together. They like the pastry cutter. Um, they learn several different skills, measuring, stirring with the spoon, stirring with the fork, stirring with the pastry blender. So, um, lots of skills. Come on, mix up here. And teaching the kids how to properly stir, we have really learned is something um, that is really important because they like to stir like one little corner about an inch across. So teaching them to stir everything together and to, you know, wipe, pull everything off the sides of your bowl. Okay, with that, we have a little extra flour in the bottom. So we're not gonna add any more flour. At this point, you're gonna put some little flour on your um, work surface. And you don't really need these. We're just gonna turn them over three or four times to kind of finish incorporating all of that flour. And while we were off camera um, or off video before our last week's one, Caitlin and I were discussing um, the baking with the Spell and Emmer and in some of her research, what she has found is that um, there's a little bit difference in how the spelt and emmer interact with the water just a little bit differently, um, which I thought was really interesting, or the liquid. And um, she said, with your spelt and emmer, don't get in a hurry to add more liquid like stir it that one more time or two more times before you get excited to add more liquid. So we're gonna, after we've folded it two or three, four times to kind of get it, all the flour worked in, you make it into a round circle. You want it about an inch, inch and a half thick. Um, I always measure with the last joint of my thumb because that's about an inch. So we're about an inch. You can either use a cookie cutter to cut out your um, scones, but what we have found that we like better because with the cookie cutter, you cut and we're gonna get four and then you have to re kind of shape your dough. And the more you mess with that dough, the tougher it becomes. So what we have found is we like to do is just cut it like, a pie. So
So you cut it in half, cut each half in half, just like you would cut a pie. And you come up with the eight scones and you never have to rework your dough. And we found that we like this method better. They're much more tender. Um, they're again, are pretty equal in size and shape. And um, once we put them on our heated cookie sheet, um, you can either use a silicone baking mat or we don't have that. So we're going to use a piece of parchment paper. And we'll just put each scone on here. And you do want to leave a little space because they are going to rise. rise. Um, and we're going to brush these lightly with a little um, egg glaze. And at that point, if you wanted to add a little um, sparkly sugar, you could do that to the top of them. And again, we're gonna just beat this egg a little. And you can put it on either with the pastry brush or um, I just fold up a little piece of paper towel. And this is the one step of the recipe that like, since you've heated your pan, you want to keep it you fairly gotta, quick. You got to work kind of quick and get. And then like, this is brush for a kid to help would be handy because that's easier for them than the paper towel egg method. They both work. Um, the pastry brush is just a little more kid user friendly. And now Erin is going to sprinkle on our um, we just have some decorator sugar. Like the bigger. And I've discovered baking. Um, this is kind of that little step that really pushes them over the top and makes them feel like you've had a really special, like from the bakery treat. And cost of these, if you were to go to the coffee shop and buy a one quarter of, or a one piece of the scone, they're probably about $3 a piece. Um, so for the eight scones, that would be $24. And we probably have, maybe a dollar fifty in in the whole recipe. So at this point they will bake for 10 to 15 minutes and um, then you can either eat them warm or eat them cold, put them in the freezer and um, bring them out you know a month from now whatever but they are quick and easy to make. Um, very cost effective and you can really dress them up and make them really look special. And it says to freeze them, just freeze them. I freeze them individually, like wrapped in saran wrap, pull them out, defrost them, pop them in a warm oven. You could pop them in the microwave. You're not going to get quite the same texture if you microwave it as if you put it back in the oven. Um, but they're fantastic. Like this is one of those things that I think intimidate a lot of people because it's like, oh, scones, very kind of hoity-toity, like there's something that's supposed to be super difficult about them. And they don't have to be because this is a really simple, fun recipe to learn to start making scones. And there's something that is super delicious. So I have a sourdough scone recipe and I've been feeding my sourdough with or sourdough starter with spelt and whole wheat. And so I'm way excited to um, make my scones again. And I'm thinking for, since we have a holiday weekend, maybe I'll bust that out um, this weekend because they are just that little bit fancier 
breakfast item or snack, like an afternoon tea or yeah. And that was my first attempt. We were having a um, tea at church and I was to bring the scones. This has been many years ago and I baked them and they were like hockey pucks. So we had to um, reevaluate what I would be taking to the tea that day. But um, this is super easy and lots of fun. So good luck with your scones. Good luck with your um, um, baking and cooking with ancient grains. And um, next week we will be back on Tuesday and we're going to um, take on a little different twist. We're going to um, talk a lot about um, family meal time, um, some how big is big, um, do a series on, on maybe not so much cooking, but other aspects of good um, nutrition. So until then, we will see you next week. And thanks for joining us.